Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. THD podcast episode 17. Today we have Matt Crowley from Vesper Mike in uh, Boston uh, calling in to join us. And a special shout out, today's sponsor is Menlo Scientific out of the Bay Area, engineering success since 1981. We encourage everybody to check out menloscientific.com to find out what they do in the audio business. All right, without further ado, let's go on to the episode. Hey everybody, Dave Lindbergh with another episode of the THD Podcast. Uh, thanks for checking in everybody. If you like what we do, please don't forget to subscribe and hit like uh, as it's kind of cliche. But uh, today with, uh, with us, we have uh, Matt Crowley call it in from, uh, from Boston, Massachusetts. So uh, thank you, Matt. Thanks for joining us. And as always, our co-host on the uh, technical side of things, Simon, with his new digital background, calling in from uh, Sendai, Japan. How's it going there today, Simon? Very good, mate. And that's right. I'm testing out a green screen with video background. So it'll be interesting to see how well this works out. Right. Testing our, our bandwidth challenges. <laughs> so, so, hey, Matt, uh, I've, I've known hey. about Vesper um, for, for a little while. It's kind of uh, what people talk about, the, the low power uh, MEMS microphone uh, in the market. So maybe can you give a bit of background about Vesper and what your ambition is as a company? Sure. So Vesper is founded on technology that was developed at the University of Michigan. Um, and is originally in the cochlear implant lab of uh, Professor Carl Grosh, where the founder Bobby Luttrell was thinking about, um, you know, what can you make with piezoelectric materials? And he's got a background in both electrical and mechanical engineering, and he really went back to the drawing board and figured out, you know, how can I change the structures of piezoelectric materials and have something that has much better SNR than what other people have been able to achieve? Because people have been working on this for, you know, roughly 20 years and it kind of slowed down because people couldn't achieve good performance. Um, so he came up with some new concepts about, you know, how to structure it, how to optimize for energy output or energy transduction. And got some funding from NASA. NASA was having an issue where um, they were wow. putting out big arrays of microphones at the end of air uh, runways. And they were using it as an acoustic camera to identify noise sources on airplanes and try to make them quieter. And the problem was that they're using, you know, older ECMs and they had to, you know, cover them up or roll them inside every night because even, you know, the, the dew and condensation could cause them to malfunction. And so they funded him to get started making something that would be more environmentally robust. He got a bunch more funding. I met him a few years later and uh, we were off to the races. So the foundational technology is basically taking piezoelectric materials, primarily aluminum nitride. And piezoelectric materials are really just materials that when you bend or stress them, generate electricity. You think of there's a lot of you know, dipoles in a material and you line them up and you get mm -hmm. a nice little electrical charge. Um, and piezoelectric materials are used in other things, but we were the first people to commercialize it for a microphone. And so the technology, you've probably seen the picture, it's very simple. It's really just a bunch of cantilevers that when the sound comes in, it goes up and down or vibrates a little bit and you amplify that and that's your signal. Um, so talk about some of the advantages is um, one of them is you have pretty good um, uh, robustness to dust and particles and water and all these things. So with a traditional mm -hmm. capacitive microphone, uh, generally you have two layers. One is a diaphragm and one is a backplate. And when anything gets trapped in between those, it'll cause the product to malfunction. Right. The piezoelectric is really more of a solid, just single cantilever. So you can put dust on it, but it doesn't actually, there's no place for it to interfere with the mechanical motion. Okay. Um, so we put them in water, we took them on a whale watch, we listened to whales underwater, we did all kinds of funny things to them, we dipped them in beer, and uh, never really had any issues. So they're great for environmentally robust stuff, you know, we've, you know, tried to put one in a fry later, and actually the MEMS was fine, but I think we melted the wires. Um, wow. But uh, it's pretty cool. So that's one advantage. Um, it's got a couple other cool things. It has a very fast startup time, because... Um, Again, capacitive microphones contain a charge pump. They have to be at a high voltage or high bias voltage. Mm -hmm. And because piezo doesn't need that, it really is instantaneous on. So as soon as you, you know, turn it on, you don't need to wait for it to settle. 
um, it's on the order of a few microseconds. Um, the MEMS has very high dynamic range. So because there's no, there's a single layer, you can really, and piezoelectric effect is linear. You know, you can hit them with extremely loud sounds. Um, and we have one part on DigiKey that goes up to, I think, an AOP of about 155 dB. Wow. Um, so pretty loud. Yeah. That's that's probably for industrial applications, I, I suppose. <laughs> it's it's for industrial, and it's also for, um, you know, doing echo cancellation in speakers or sound bars. So you can actually put this inside a speaker cone or adjacent to a speaker cone. Right. And, you know, use that to improve the voice experience um, and basically do some echo canceling. So one of the challenges in some of the high-end um, speakers and sound bars and TVs, if you put a microphone too close to a speaker, uh, it can get saturated. And so this allows you to do some cancellation. So that's a specialty part um, called the 2020. Um, and then we have our other cool thing, which is um, using – the MEMS element to effectively gather sound energy or take sound energy and turn a system on from being asleep. Mm -hmm. And that's been probably the biggest driver of our sales, you know, or in some, you know, things like remote controls where you don't need to push a button, but it's always listening for voice. So I'll talk a little bit more about how that works, but the basic architectural concept is, you know, if you go back to like the, the N0 program at DARPA, there's this concept of event-driven sensors. So the idea is if you have a battery-powered system or something that is used intermittently, it takes a lot of power to plug it in and have it kind of running all the time. And so the concept was, well, geez, if I could have a system where some type of sensor actually turns it on and turns it off and mm -hmm. only the system is only active when it's being used, that would be a great way to save power. Um, you can think about, you know, the ideas there were little sensors, you know, I don't know, spread out all over, all over the world, uh, turning on a microphone or camera or something when something happens and then going back to sleep. So these are these kind of IoT sensor nodes. So, you know, we took that concept and said, you know, it's cool that the piezo element is actually generating a little bit of charge just sitting on a table, you know, even if it's not attached to an ASIC, it doesn't have to be, uh, volt, you know, held at a bias voltage. And so we took that and we attached it to a sort of comparator that basically can detect when a voltage occurs. And we set out to make a product that we called our 1010, which was really a microphone that had a fixed wake threshold. So it would wake up whenever sound occurred above a certain threshold to go back to sleep uh, after it was over. And the reason that would save a lot of power is because, um, again, the system was effectively turned off half the time the microphone, when it was in this, you know, quiescent mode, would only consume about 10 microamps. Um, so very, very little power. And the rest of the system could be turned off. So that's how that um, architecture helps save power at the system level. So it's not just that the microphone itself is low power, but that it is it's toggling on the entire rest of the system. So it, it um, actually essentially is triggering the like the microcontroller, whatever's behind that electrically. To, to just just wait for us get, get in the queue when when you when we say go go so that's that's exactly great. wow can i say so, a step back matthew because i just wanted to get an understanding of a couple of things so you're using uh sometimes you're saying mems and sometimes you're saying piezo are you using the two interchangeably is it a piezo do, element the, inside the, a mems package the the mems is made out of a piezoelectric material so are all the, MEMS microphones um, piezoelectric? No, we're the only ones. So okay, the only most, ones, yeah. all other MEMS microphones are made out of silicon. Okay. And um, uh, so uh, made out of silicon, but they act as a capacitive device. And your one, exactly. is, not, your one is working as a, this, uh, this uh, cantilever effect that you said. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's simple. It's actually, it's a cantilever. You, you know, you bend it a tiny bit and because the piezoelectric material generates uh, current, you amplify that and there's your signal. Yep, right. And uh, there's, there's still a diaphragm. Is there still a uh, front cavity, rear cavity separated by a diaphragm? Yes, there is. And our diaphragm is a series of triangular cantilevers. It uh, looks kind of like a stop sign, an octagon. Right. 
Right, right. And there's a there's a gap in between those which uh, defines the low frequency roll off. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, would, and, would which you is have typically a, at what at what uh, point would you have a minus three dB? Um, we have built parts with different uh, minus three dB points because we can we can widen or uh, shrink that gap. Um, so you know anywhere f we've built we have different parts with different values anywhere from twenty to eighty five. Okay. Okay. So. Low. Yeah. And we have seen a trend uh, towards a lot of applications looking for lower. Um, so I think a few years ago, 85 was standard in the industry. I think uh, people are trying to find that balance of, you know, not picking up too much low frequency yeah. that you don't want to hear. Um, but I think with some of the new ANC uh, algorithms, they're looking for some of that um, lower frequency stuff. Yep, for sure. Uh, would, would you have any images on a slide so people can kind of picture what these might look like? Uh, yes, I do. Let me... Uh... <laughs> sure. I'm curious, if you don't mind asking while you're doing that. So the piezo material, uh, if you bend it and then keep it in a statically bent position, uh, what is the charge state? It, it generates a charge uh, as it's uh, changing its dimension or due to internal stress? It's, it's sort of due to internal stress. So you can think about it, it's a sort of an, an amorphous crystal with a bunch of little dipoles in it. And when you, you stress it, you sort of align them and mm -hmm. uh, that generates a potential. And so it'll stay there, but I, it, um, uh, but if you, so if I think you were to short that, uh, that link, what happens? Um, if you were to short the link, then you get a, you know, there's a charge and then it's, it's kind of over with. So it, it does have to be continuously moving. Um, yep. You well, right. Okay. Static. Then put it another way, if you had an infinite impedance and you bent it, you would see a constant uh, DC voltage due to that uh, yes. bend. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. Yep. 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 Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll pull up a photo of it. Uh, yeah. I think that'd be helpful. I can even show you one on our, uh, a cool one on our website. Um, so then you get a signal as uh, as uh, this this voltage. You need to amplify it. What to, what signal level are you beginning with? Um, it's it's quite small. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but you know we're talking uh, pico level uh, okay. thing. So it's okay. it's not anything that. Um, you know, people say, oh, you're doing energy harvesting. Can you actually power the microphone um, with that? And the answer is no, you can't. Um, but it is something that you can detect and amplify. And um, uh, it, 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 that works pretty well. So yep. um, I just pull up a cool looking picture here. Um, one of my many, uh, many, many presentations I've been doing. So, um, yeah, and so, you know, not, again, I'm not, I'm actually not, not the piezoelectric effect expert, but um, okay. it, um, it, it is a pretty cool um, type of device. And so, so part of the main, the main sort of uh, advantage compared to a capacitive device is that it's uh, a lot more robust it's a lot more robust and that we have this architecture where you can do the so-called zero power listening. Okay. Okay. Um, in the longer term, we believe that what we've developed is a technology where you can make other types of sensors. Um, you know, so in the future, one of the areas we're looking at is something like, for example, a more of a, uh, a voice accelerometer or bone conduction type of microphone, uh -huh. um, which we're actually seeing become popular, um, in the, uh, in the TWS headset space. So we're, we've gotten pretty interested in that space. It seems to be one of the fastest growing uh, spaces in the uh, entire consumer electronics industry. And, um, you know, that one is, uh, is this, is this uh, technology tied up to Vesper? So when people go shopping that they can only call you guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're the only ones that sell this. Um, okay. You know, we had looked at doing, we have distributors and people like that, but, um, uh, oops, a little crash on my computer here. 
Um, I was just trying to find a really good picture of our part. It actually might be easiest to go um, to our website. But um, it's, uh, I, I would say those, those are the big advantages. And so we, uh, right now, on, in terms of SNR, I think we are, um, I'll just, I'll show our, uh, some pictures on our website, I think. Um, Right now, our SNR is, uh, you know, probably we've built parts over 70. They were a bit larger, um, so we can certainly do that. But um, we uh, we are making some improvements to make the SNR higher. Um, so I don't know if you can see, but here's a picture up here in, in the corner oh, of yeah. our um, device. And uh, you can see how the triangular elements, you know, make a complete diaphragm. And so this is a microphone with the lid removed. So you're basically looking at it as you would from the back cavity. And you can see there's a very small uh, circuit there. Just in case, this was an analog microphone, so it was fairly small. The digital one would be bigger. And our so-called zero power listening microphone um, has some additional ASIC circuitry, which is basically detecting the uh, sound when it occurs. Now we have released a second generation so-called zero power listening microphone, which has some additional intelligence as well as a digital PDM output. And this device has what we call an adaptive threshold. And so we found in the fixed threshold devices, you know, you're getting pretty good power savings, but you still would have a lot of um, false wakes if you're in an environment with fairly continuous noise. And the use case we're thinking about is say I have a little thing that looks like a you know, Amazon speaker, but it's battery yeah. powered. And I want to speak to it and say, you know, Alexa, I oh, didn't go off somewhere. Um, <laughs> you know, where are you? And, uh, but have that be battery powered. And so no one's really been able to make these things battery powered so far and have good battery life. Um, so with our technology, if you're in a um, noisy room, the device is only consuming 20 microwatts all the time. Then all of a sudden sound occurs and it, w it wakes up the device, the microphone sends this, you know, audio signature to the DSP or the um, ARM core that analyzes it, makes sure it's the keyword and then wakes up the rest of the system. Now, if the room was noisy, you might have that triggering all the time and it's kind of not really helping you save much battery life. And so what we came up with for this new part was a threshold that will basically listen to the background noise level and automatically raise or lower the threshold based on how noisy it is. And so if you're in your room watching TV and the TV's kind of, you know, playing and it would normally be triggering the device, it'll actually, you know, raise the threshold and it takes only a fraction of a second to adapt. Yeah. And then um, because we find as we as humans always generally speak about the background noise level, um, we sort of, you know, I think it's called the Lindbergh effect. We, we just automatically adapt. Um, so you can use that. So people are still saying keywords above that ambient noise level. And so when we did that, we found that this new architecture would actually keep the system in the slow power mode about 92% of the time. Um, so that's pretty cool because it meant that, you know, with a couple of things running in the background, the whole system is consuming, you know, probably sub 100 microwatts over 90% of the time. And this is how we this is how we get our, you know, what, what I like to claim is a 10x increase in battery life or 10x uh, decrease in average power consumption because you know system can be turned off more than 90 percent of the time right. now depending on the environment that can vary a little bit there's probably cases where you could get a 20x increase there's probably you know some cases where there's just a lot more going on where you're not going to get quite as much but you still you'll still get a pretty good power savings um so on that VM1010, uh, one of those uh, pins is actually an interrupt line? Yes, okay. exactly. So that, and, that would uh, be a, a big application. I mean, not just your Amazon Alexa device and uh, you have a bunch of people over and there's a party. But one of the big things for this, I know, is battery powered devices with like true wireless stereo and people want to add Alexa or Hey Siri function to those uh, devices. But then maybe they like in Hong Kong here, they get on the train and now how do they say, you know, Alexa answer call 
without over the noise floor of, of the train and all the people on it. And so that yeah. I've been in some projects for these things and basically hadn't gone forward yet because of how to deal with those environments. So this sounds like you might have, you know, licked it. This this would definitely be helpful. And I can give you a preview. We do have another product coming out um, that we started sampling, um, which is what we would call a voice accelerometer or sort of like a bone conduction. Mm -hmm. And it actually uses a very similar structure to our normal in-air microphone. However, it's, uh, it's lower bandwidth. It's about a three kilohertz peak. And so this is really optimized to detect your voice through your skull. And so I'm sure you're familiar with you know, some of the higher end bone conduction systems. This is something that's, you know, priced in the same realm as a MEMS microphone, um, has pretty good sensitivity. It's an analog output and it's going to be quite um, low in power consumption. And so we are hopeful that the use, some of the use cases you just described, that would be a nice complement to the microphones because um, effectively we said, what's the use of this device? And, you know, I think the noise floor is not a, you know, it's not a super low noise floor so that you can use it without microphones. But if you use it with microphones, of course, you can filter out a lot of background noise, especially things like wind. So I know in a lot of the ANC yeah. systems, you know, I, I've got these on. And if you're sitting on an airplane and you've got a jet of air, um, you know, coming at your, uh, your, your microphones, they can get um, saturated. Um, or if you're just out in a windy environment. Or trains are actually also one of the tricky environments um, for ANC. So we found that having that, you know, bone conduction signal through your skull helps a lot in your use cases. Now, of course, we can in the future combine that zero power feature into the um, bone conduction microphone also, and you can wake it up with your voice. But um, there are some cool things you can do with it. Like one is one simple one is, is effectively that device knows when you are speaking and when you are not speaking. So if we were on a call like this, I might say, I want to put on a automatic mute feature where um, if I was in a noisier place, I could say, I just want this to mute whenever I'm not speaking you know, so that, you know, have you been on a lot of zoom calls? I've had some that, you know, look like the, the Brady Bunch TV show with this array of, you know, 16 people or 20 people and people are constantly muting and unmuting themselves. And, um, yeah, and it's, it's the typical I, thing where the guy forgets to unmute and makes his big pitch to the boss and nobody's heard him. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, I hate to say I've been I've been there more times than I wish, you know, that this last couple of months where, you know, I can sit there talking for 30 seconds and you have people say, hey, we cannot hear you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as technologists and engineers, we sort of say we will, you know, turning it on and off is way too hard. We just need to automate that. Right. Um, so we think we think that space has a lot of promise. There's other things we're we're seeing like. Um, biometric voice voice authentication and sort of yeah. conceptually if you can do it both through your skull and through the air it's almost like a dual we call it dual factor voice authentication um so lots of lots of cool stuff on the horizon um but i certainly think the headset or tws space is is um it's very exciting and um going what to is huge it, what is it like in terms of frequency response um so the, the bone conduction i think has a frequency peak at around three kilohertz um it's it's you know it's first modal vibration flat. so below that it's flat until it's lower roll off below that it's pretty flat yeah, yeah. it's um sure frequency plot but it's it does it, it's it's you know a gentle slope down yep. okay. um whereas i think the microphone tends to be a bit more of a spike um and so we've actually we were doing studies we you know and it's it's interesting because you're talking about test setups is there's no really good test setup uh, for sound conducted through the human skull. Uh, so we actually had to use people and, you know, employees where we were sticking things in their ears and trying to record them speaking and understand what that sound profile looked like, um, which was kind of cool. So, um, yeah, so microphones are obviously our first product, but we, we feel that the technology, because it's really technology that can make many different types of um, resonant structures, uh, can be used for other things. And so we thought about, you know, in the longer term future, we can make a smaller one. We can do ultrasonic devices. Um, people want to use those for proximity sensing or things like that. Um, you can also use the technology to obviously make speakers, um, obviously, you know, something very small that might be replaced, replace the balanced armature. Um, so that's another area of interest in the long term future. So we think, you know, the TWS is, is a very sensor heavy um, device mm -hmm. and it needs low power. It needs pretty 
um, high quality devices and needs really good performance. And um, I, I always give my pitch if I'm talking to some people say, you know, the TWS, it's like having a, it's like having a smartphone worth of sensors per ear. Um, which if you, if you look at, you know, a high end device like AirPod Pro, I mean, there's, um, there's three microphones, there's a voice accelerometer, there's a normal accelerometer. Um, and most, you know, most flagship phones have three microphones or occasionally four. So it's, um, and, certainly uh, a nice commercial opportunity. And what kind of footprints on the PCBA are we talking about? They look pretty small from here, but uh, with the like AirPods Pro, you don't have a lot of real estate. So uh, what are we talking about for a footprint? Yeah, so some of our older products are, um, you know, 3.76 by 2.95. Our newer products, um, I think we have stuff where we're trying to, uh, you know, get below two millimeters a side. I think we're down to about almost around two by three. Um, and so small size is definitely important as is, as a Z height below one millimeter. Um, is, is that going to be similar to a traditional MEMS where it can affect uh, the range, the frequency range? The, um, yeah. So the piezo MEMS is, um, in terms of the impact of the package size and back cavity volume, it is similar. Um, in fact, we think, you know, as MEMS are getting better, someday you're going to have a limitation of back cavity volume more than uh, the MEMS in terms of achieving SNR if we if you project out five years. Okay. Um, so it is similar for us. If we make a package bigger, the performance overall is generally better. So there's there's also a challenge for us when you go to small form factors in uh, you know increasing the noise and, and changing the uh, frequency response. Um, when you talk about um, SNR, are you kind of using that interchangeably with sensitivity, let's say, so that you package the two meanings into one? Yeah, I think for us, um, we certainly think uh, SNR is um, the more, you know, we have amplifiers in our microphones, so we can we can do, we can have programmable sensitivity, but the SNR, of course, is more inherent right. to the product. And uh, the... Um, as we continue to develop our technology, we're looking at improving the piezo films to increase the sensitivity. And for us to increase the sensitivity requires um, basically a stronger piezoelectric effect, so more energy for the same amount of motion. And uh, what we're seeing is there are new piezoelectric materials coming online that have much uh, higher uh, piezoelectric constant than the uh, ones we used originally. In fact, we're already on our second generation, so I think our first microphones were probably around 61. Now they're, you know, 65, 66. And we could see a path getting above 70 again in a fairly small package. Um, and then for us, the noise is really, it's also more of a piezoelectric film characteristic. Um, whereas I think in some of the capacitive microphones, the noise uh, limit is the um, squeeze film damping between the two, the diaphragm and the back plate. Um, so basically, you know, pushing that air in that you know, one micron on sensitivity yeah. for a minute though. Uh, so the uh, your classic um, uh, electret capsule microphone, they would have like a minus 38 dB uh, volts uh, yeah. of sensitivity. And then the MEMS microphones also were set at about the same level, even although they had an amplifier inside. So you could choose anything. Is there just a conformity to a, a kind of a de facto standard, or is there another reason why they was uh, um, that level? 12 and a yeah, half, so we uh, 12 and a half volt millivolts per Pascal is the one. Yeah. So I think originally it was, that was the convention. It was to make it compatible um, and to minimize the amplification. What we have seen, and we've actually done a lot of, you know, we talked to chip partners and say, so what's the actual optimal value? And um, it depends a little bit on, whether, so whether you have an analog or, or digital microphone, but say it's an analog one, it depends on the noise floor of the ADC. Um, so we have seen um, some digital microphones going to lower sensitivity. And the reason they do that is to get uh, basically a wider voltage rail so you can have higher AOP. Um, so yeah. you don't have the, the clipping. And there's a little bit of a design challenge, of course, to make the sensitivity lower, but not um, make the SNR worse. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we also are, are developing things with, um, uh, we're seeing this trend towards some lower sensitivity to get that little bit more AOP. I, I don't think you can go incredibly low. Um, 
but that is a desire. And right, I think, yeah. you know, so if, you, if you have a 150 dB uh, AOP microphone, then your uh, 94 dB SPL voltage has to be actually really tiny. I don't know. I wouldn't do the calculation, but it would have to be uh, one millivolt yeah. or less, in fact. Yeah, so that's a special part. And so that one, we actually also had to take down the SNR a, a little bit, actually. Yeah. Um, and uh, I can't remember what the um, output voltage is, but um, it, uh, of course, we have our data sheet here. But um, uh, it, um, it we, we did have to basically knock, effectively knock down the signal. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that microphone... Uh, we effectively shifted the operating range to higher, so it doesn't really work well at low SPL. Right. So it is kind of a specialty product. Um, however, in the future, we can take that, and you know, we're looking at doing things like moded products, where you know something can automatically shift to a a different um, you know voltage rail when when the uh, sound level gets too high. Right. So, um, it and I think when people talk about AOP. Um, one interesting point is there's the AOP of the MEMS and the AOP of the ASIC. And the, the ASIC is generally limited by, you know, ultimately the supply voltage. Um, you know, you're eventually going to hit the rails. The MEMS, in the case of a lot of the capacitive ones, you, you have cases where actually the diaphragm physically strikes the back plate. And, you know, that's kind of a worse overload because you can actually have sometimes electrostatic capture where things get stuck. Um, oh. which is not desirable. And, and it also affects the recovery time from an AOP event. So one of the things, um, even in our normal microphones, we, we spend time thinking about is, is with us, the piezo MEMS can go to these extremely high um, SPL levels without clipping at, at the MEMS level. Right, so just, to, get, just as, to clarify, that's because there is no backplate. This there's no back way so the thing just it's just swinging and it's a it's a linear effect so um the uh the piezo mem therefore it will recover instantaneously because the asic might be clipping because you're hitting the voltage rail but the, the mems itself is fine so the mems never it goes non-linear it gets stuck or anything like that um and so uh you know so that part's out there if you have any crazy <laughs> funny needs um or if you for some reason, want to put a microphone inside a speaker or, or some. Can you tell us who, uh, what applications is it used for? Measuring Formula One um, noise or something like that. It's it it is designed to go into speakers and to do you know help with improving the echo cancellation and things like that. Okay. Um, you know, we have a lot of theories about how it could be used in the future. Things about you know real time measuring nonlinearities in a speaker uh, and trying to correct for them and things like that, but. Um, so it's a fairly specialty part. Um, and so we're looking at putting into things, sound bars, you know, anything where you're encountering loud noises. Um, I think there are some people using it for some industrial applications, like you mentioned, but, uh, you know. Yeah, I know, I know that the- Formula one's yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, the F1 guys. Uh, I know that it was an issue early days where people wanted to add things like Alexa and the, the wake word guys into sound bars. But they just couldn't. Just trying to tackle that with the the noise floor coming out of the soundbar was uh, almost a non-starter a few years ago. Yeah. So I guess this has become reality now. That do you, do you, would that then commercially see that because the the feature is the smart speaker in the center of the home. So now based on using a Vesper microphone, would people be able to just buy a soundbar and then they they don't have to buy this additional product potentially? The Amazons might not like that, but uh, the customers yeah. might. Yeah, so you, you could do that. So I think voice and sound bars and voice and TVs is something people are looking at. You know, that product is is fairly new, so people are integrating it. And it, it is a bit more of a complex uh, task. Mm -hmm. But these um, uh, it is a great microphone for that application. I, I do find it's funny because um, a lot of the big voice assistant uh, giant companies think about it in terms of voice share. And um, it becomes a case where just because I have, um, you know, a good voice assistant in my TV doesn't necessarily mean I don't want to buy a speaker. And, and there's also commercial reasons. Those, those may be two different companies um, yeah. that are just trying to sell you their thing. And so you might have several voice assistants in your home and 
there's work about trying to make those more interoperable. But um, I think for the the hardware company, it's like, hey, I want to provide the voice assistant I want to provide, and um, I'm not going to worry so much about it. And I and I think as engineers, we always say, <laughs> we go, well, it'd be efficient if you just had a single speaker, and then you know through Bluetooth or something controlled all these other devices. Um, but what we found is it, it is a little bit easier just to let me just put a microphone in, in the thing I want to control. And um, I don't have that dependency potentially on someone else's um, infrastructure. Um, so, yeah, you know, if, brand A. Yeah. Yeah. And definitely low power. I mean, you talk about like uh, light switches or something like this, which are mains powered, but there's always this idea of like kinetic light switches or something and you just want to talk to it. Um, yep this kind of ultra low power, you don't need the Wi-Fi radio or Bluetooth radio. Uh, or, and so it just kind of overall re reduces the power, power pull on everything. So, yeah, we, and we find there's a lot of home safety uh, and home yeah. security cameras and things is another good application uh, where people are thinking about putting these things in their house and making them battery powered. Um, so for a lot of the smart home devices, the, if you have to attach it to means power, um, it, it does become a pretty big barrier to adoption, especially if your assuming house, that you're actually yeah, especially hardwiring if your house, it. Yeah. Especially if your house is already built. Like, uh, yeah. like, like new home builds in the U S that's an easy, you know, you relatively easy thing to smart tech it out. But in, in Europe and other places in the world, it's, it's all renovation uh, homes. Um, it's not so easy to get all that fancy kit in there if you have to wire it. Yeah, absolutely. And Boston's got a lot of old houses in it. So, yeah, um, <laughs> that's what I was thinking about. <laughs> um, so it, it's even if you know how to do it, it, it's just a, it's a big hassle to be running wires through your walls. And, um, most people would much prefer to do a battery powered. Then you get to the next challenge, which is, okay, I have this wonderful battery powered thing. Uh, I don't want to be changing that battery every week. Um, and, if you look at some of the smart speakers that are plugged into the wall, I mean, these things are consuming, you know, five watts continuously, uh, even when they're not in use. And, um, you know, one of our, one of my new things I would like to work on is to try to promote this event driven sensor as a, um, you know, green technology that helps just reduce energy consumption. Um, we're starting out on battery power stuff. Cause I think that's where the, um, mm -hmm. you know, need is more obvious and greatest. And I think um, it, it sometimes is hard to sell energy efficiency as a feature, but um, you know, hopefully longer term as the technology gets out there, people will say, Hey, you know, a lot of the idle load consumption in somebody's house, their TV, their speakers, all these kinds of things um, are consuming energy all the time. And I think uh, there was a study done in California where it said about 23% of um, electricity consumed in a typical household is uh this idle load electronics and so it's think almost, of that 22% yeah it's almost like you could it could hear the rustle of the humans and then wake up to serve them in a, in a exactly space. yeah yeah, yeah. You know, I, I was looking around you know why you know i have a microwave that's in a inside a cabinet and i'm like well, why does the clock led need to be running all the time <laughs> um when I'm not using it, it seems, seems quite wasteful, particularly and not just for saving money, but obviously there's some, so these days there's a lot of concern about too much, um, yeah, electricity so also, and energy with, being used with the, with the ex enough sensitivity, it could be replacing motion sensors in office buildings for lights off, lights off, all kinds of things that could go to sleep. And I think it it's could. the, the CA 65 initiative for low power. I don't know what the thresholds are, but, uh, might be able to push that even um, lower. Yeah, so you know our our new product, I think the lowest thresholds around forty dB, and uh, you know it's always possible to do that. We also, um, in addition to the adaptive mode, it does have the ability for the user to program it if they prefer. So if they don't want us to control it, it's probably the easiest way to do it. But if they have a special application or use case. Um, there's a lot of programmability in setting the threshold, changing it dynamically in the field. You know, you can change it all the time if you have a certain algorithm looking for something. Uh, there's also some amount of frequency discrimination. So, um, you know, when it's functional, it runs like a normal microphone. But when it's in this low power mode, you can actually uh, reduce the frequency range or shift it a little bit if you're looking for some type of specific sound. And, and the idea there, yeah. Would that have big applications in hearing aids where perhaps 
different environments they're trying to tune to listen to different things? Um, yeah, you know, possibly if you want to wake things up and save power, um, that would be a good one. We, you know, we've seen one of the issues in hearing aids is, is ultrasonics uh, coupling into um, the uh, you know, speaker. So uh, ultrasonic resistance has been a feature people have been looking for um, that we provide. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that uh, that could definitely work potentially. Um, okay. How do the, yeah, I mean, how uh, the uh, uh, mics uh, stack up in terms of cost compared to uh, um, literates? You know, they're in the same ballpark as a normal uh, capacitive MIPS microphone. Um, and I will say the the smart microphone generally there is a bit of a premium. Um, you know, maybe fifty percent or 100% over a typical comparative uh, dumb microphone. Mm -hmm. um, the normal microphones are, are, are quite similar. Uh, I think maybe there's a bit of a premium for the waterproof, dustproof aspect. Um, but the manufacturing is, you know, done at scale. These are done on, you know, big wafers yep. and uh, have very similar assembly process to other MEMS microphones. Okay. One of the uh, one of the things that we uh, market is because our product is waterproof and dustproof. Um, if you're trying to get a certain IP rating, you know, waterproof or dustproof, you don't have to use a protective mesh or membrane. Uh, can we um, talk a little bit about the waterproofing? So um, how, yep. uh, I don't know. Can you tell us how is that done? You just let the water get in; it doesn't affect anything. Yeah. So. <clears throat> we say it's water resistant, so it, it passes IPX7 uh, quite easily, which is one meter for 30 minutes. Yeah. <clears throat> and the way it's waterproof is there's really nowhere for the water to go. So if you look at this um, this picture, imagine the water on the other side of the acoustic port. Um, because of surface tension, the water cannot really get through these little gaps in the cantilevers. And so the water just kind of sits on the MEMS, and that side of the MEMS is passivated, meaning it's got a protective layer on it at the MEMS level, which we deposit at the MEMS factory. Mm -hmm. And so the water just kind of sits there and eventually, you know, dries out and the product is, is normal. Um, we've tried it with uh, salt water, with um, beer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's actually a Carlsberg beer commercial, um, which I can send you the link, that shows them... Uh, making a, a commercial called the sound of beer where they put our microphone inside the beer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Send us, and, uh, send us the link into we'll the bubbles. It. Yes. Send yeah. Us the link we'll put it in um, the description below. And we did manage to record a little bit of whale on a company whale watch. So, um, it's, it's pretty tough. And, uh, uh, the, uh, if you brought it to an extreme depth, eventually the water would push through and it yeah. would go into the back cavity. Uh, that wouldn't really permanently damage the microphone, but it would, you know, fill up some of the back cavity. And there is the risk that you could short something, you know, bridges two wires or something. Uh, but it would come back eventually. Even, um, just, a, so even just a droplet of water wouldn't flow down the acoustic port, would it? It's fairly uh, small. The See. acoustic port's pretty small. Um, but if the acoustic port does get filled with water, you could sort of tap and it, it comes out. I see. Yeah. Um, We've also done experiments with oils. Um, and uh, this was funny was we did a test where there were, you know, people are looking at putting microphones into the hood of an oven uh, and doing, using it to try to do some noise canceling or some kind of voice interface with the stove. And of course, when you're cooking, you know, there's oil flying everywhere. And um, we put it over a little uh, thing of boiling oil and oil jumped up, it got all over the MEMS element and it didn't yeah. uh, affect the performance at all. And then we filled up the acoustic part with oil. <laughs> it actually was beautiful. It flattened the frequency peak, but the rest of the <laughs> microphone was great. I said it was like the, the best uh, frequency response we've ever uh, produced was when we filled up the acoustic part with oil. So, I like yeah. it. A huge, a huge benefit to, I mean, I've, I, you don't know this, Matt, but I did a lot of the nano coating previously on all the headphones from 2011 until today. And it's always the microphone that's the barrier to get everything done, sweat-proof, waterproof. Uh, so it looks like yep. you guys got the last step in the electronic circuit for protection, which is exciting. Yeah, it, wor 
it works pretty well. And we have put the parts through some of the nano coatings, um, and it, it seems to be perfectly compatible. So we may not necessarily need it, but some customers right. are saying, hey, if I'm just running my system through the nano coat uh, yeah, process. The- the rest well, it damage the microphones. Exactly. Fine. Well, yeah, no, the, and the, the vacuum ones will, yeah, so that's a good question. Is the vacuum pressure, has that impacted any of the, the piezoelectric uh, cantilevers? No, it doesn't. Um, not if you put it through stat. So we put it through some funny pressure cycling and things like that. Um, so yeah, and, and just it worked pretty decrease, fine. decrease the pull of the vacuum. Don't pull the vacuum so fast. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, I've got a lot of customers the, that uh, do that. If you're pulling a if you're pulling a vacuum, it will not affect the MEMS. I think the only case I was thinking about, if you had a vacuum pick and you stuck it right over the acoustic port and you know kind of yanked it pretty hard, that um, that could be an issue. But if you just put it in a chamber and bring your vacuum, it won't it won't really do much. And with, I think I think with the capacitive part of the issue is the, is the again the membrane is kind of moving together, um, whereas ours you know just swings around and. Yeah, with with fine. with traditional mems, there there is an issue. Most of the diaphragms usually pop back after a time, but usually yep. the the problem is is then when it goes to QC test in the factory, it hasn't popped back yet, so the failure rates are up. Maybe in the field it might pop back, but it's too much risk to ship. So yeah, kind of overcomes that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and we find this is that's a similar story to some of the high OP events. So anything that causes these to, things to stick together, they might eventually pop out. And sometimes, you know, people are sitting there banging stuff and it, <laughs> it pops back. <laughs> I uh, see people there. Um, I, we know the we know the problem occurs. We've looked at some online forums where people say, "Well, I solved it by sticking a, a toothpick through the acoustic port of my device." And I said, "You know, that that will destroy any <laughs> any yeah. microphone. So you really shouldn't do that." Uh, this, you know. These are extremely thin. You can actually bend our membrane quite a bit, but again, if you jam a paper clip through it, you will break it. Um, okay. But uh, overall, you know, pretty durable little things. Um, we've done shock tests, drop tests, you know, it survives all those kind of standard things. Um, and okay. uh, and then, coatings uh, are a cool concept. I think that's uh, is uh, one thing like for, for customer service, you guys are, are based in Boston, but you're having offices around the place, like around the world where we do, we have offices in uh, California, in uh, Taiwan, in uh, Shenzhen Mm -hmm. and in uh, Korea. Okay. And we also have some uh, partner reps in uh, Europe and uh, we're planning to expand uh, next year into Europe and Japan directly. So, okay. And uh, there's more opportunity out there. And we also plan to continue to expand in other regions of China, uh, Shanghai. Okay. Yeah, and then there's uh, the uh, the offshoring is a big topic uh, lately. I know that, uh, well, I mean, um, there's some hearing aid work in Thailand and such. There's a lot of uh, earphones for big guys in Vietnam. So you're, you're got that on the radar uh, as well, I'm sure. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I think those, you know, Shenzhen obviously were very active. Um, and uh, having and having local support, as you know, is uh, absolutely critical. So we do have a, a pretty good experienced team there, uh, which will continue to expand. Okay. And you know, we also we enjoy working with chip, certain chip partners and trying to do you know com- complete solutions and reference designs and things like that. So I think um, there's always people interested in um, figuring out how to ways to accelerate time to market. And and I think you know you and I talked earlier about when you have a new component that can enable a new feature. Uh, a lot of people are excited about it, but you do need to provide some uh, support in the application engineering to make sure that people can actually implement it. Yeah, I, I always I always call it the seagulling effect, which is basically the 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 technology provider from Europe comes in and or wherever U.S. comes in and craps on everything and then leaves, and the poor poor production manager and engineer in Shenzhen is like, what do I do next? And so having that yeah. local support is critical. Yeah, and, and as you know, audio is, is tricky. I mean, there's a lot of things in, in technology that are not easy, but um, ANC is a good example. There's huge um, interest in doing ANC, and I think um, a lot of people have figured out it's actually it's actually pretty difficult. Um, you know, it, it, um, of course, many people have done it, but it, it is still a pretty technically challenging thing to do. 
And there's a lot of little details that matter a lot. So we, you know, we have our expertise, which is more in the, in the microphone. And so we do try to do things like um, help with placement of microphones. And, you know, if you're going to use, um, you know, voice accelerometer placement of that is very critical. Um, you have to have good knowledge about how people's heads vibrate. Um, right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, help, help, uh, help the customer uh, accelerate their product to the market as fast as possible with the best feature set they can get. Okay. Is there any other technical questions you can think of, Simon? Uh, no, no, that's very interesting. Thanks very much, Matthew. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you. You, pushed, you pushed me to the limits. I, uh, <laughs> I was going to phone a friend and call my CTO a few times. And the company is uh, privately held? It is privately held. And we have uh, some venture capital investors, also some uh, corporate investors such as Amazon uh, through their Alexa fund, um, mm. Bose. And yep. uh, sure, which you, I'm sure you guys know. Yeah. Um, and a couple, Synaptics is one uh, that makes some audio chips. So, a couple strategic investors as well as a couple of uh, venture capital funds. All right. Well, um, I guess I guess that's all we need to talk about. It's almost an hour on Vesper, which is probably very um, in depth, and uh, what we love yep. it. This is what we do here on the THD podcast. So. Uh, very special thanks to Simon for chiming in from Japan, as always, and and Matt Crowley. Yep. Can't can't thank you enough for taking the time, staying up a bit late. Sure. Looks like you're yep. <laughs> you're ready for ready for some crib. So, uh, very yeah. nice to talk with you today, and um, uh, look forward to seeing what's coming next from Vesper. So, thanks everybody okay. for watching. Thanks, guys. It was fun. Okay, thank take you. care. Bye bye.